Most movements and revolutions are formed on an ideology. I'm convinced that I'm watching a future significant social network grow in real time. You heard it here first, folks. The next big thing you've never heard of. ChatGPT doesn't replace an accountant or replace a lawyer. Yet. We're gonna lose our jobs. You're not all gonna lose your jobs. God, just, right. You're not gonna lose your job. You're not gonna lose your job. You know, you're not gonna lose your job. We're going to see radical, experimental updates. You should pay attention. In this week's episode, we cover a lot. Starting with virtual fashion. What role does virtual fashion have in the world? And how should brands be thinking about it? We're one year in to Elon Musk being at the helm of X, formerly known as Twitter. What's the verdict? What do we think? Catman reveals a new social app with just a few thousand users that he believes and predicts is going to be the next big thing. We dive into the creator economy, talking specifically about creator-led brands, what can companies learn from them, and we must not forget to conflate influence or true influence with a social following. We discuss product marketing. Catman gives his tips and tricks for optimal success for your next campaign launches. And finally, we debate the company of the moment, OpenAI, more specifically ChatGPT. Now the hype has died down, is ChatGPT really going to change the world? We have 20 minutes of insights on Kim Kardashian. That's all you need to know. Yeah, we did. We, talk, we talked about um, 20 minutes on Kim Kardashian. Tune in. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe, like, all of that stuff. <laughs> Kalban, good to see you. How are you doing? Doing well, Ollie. Doing well. How are you? How was your recent trip to the US? It was good. I am a little disappointed I am now wearing a jumper. When we last spoke, I was wearing short shorts, the t-shirt. Now I have the winter wear on. But there is part of me is kind of a little glad because I, over the years, have collected a pretty decent winter wardrobe. You know when you have those hoodies that you like? I got a decent yeah. jacket collection. So um, that's one positive to the British weather. You didn't. You didn't fancy wearing it today, though. No, no. <laughs> it's, it's it's Halloween today, isn't it? Or tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will. I will tell you a funny story. I've just come from a uh, a conference. It was a virtual fashion summit. It was a beautiful venue. It was at the Royal Theatre, and it was a collection of brands, futurists, technologists, and people working in virtual fashion. And this is the first time in a while that I was a little paranoid about what I should wear. I kind of went, I'm going to be around loads of fashionable people. They're probably going to judge me with what I wear. And so I went super simple, wide jumper. Well, we'll take the choice out of the, uh, <laughs> out the decision-making process. <laughs> to kick off this week, let's build on that point, virtual fashion. So... The conference I just attended, I was fortunate to watch some of the panelists debate topics um, ahead of speaking about generative AI. And it, uh, I got a really interesting insider take on virtual fashion. So when you typically go to a room like this, you're speaking to the converted. These are small communities that are doing interesting, innovative things. And usually everyone's you know, smelling the Kool-Aid. Everyone's drinking the same drink. But what was really interesting about here is it was a very mature take and it was a very practical debate around the role of virtual fashion in the world. Obviously, the people building in virtual fashion have a commercial agenda, so they want to see something really significant happen now in the near future. But the majority of people that we're building, we're kind of balanced and saying, you know what? Virtual fa fashion is so nascent and for it to form a part of, or a meaningful part of society, we're gonna have to wait some time. 
And the spatial computing wave that hits us next year with Apple is not the thing that is going to be the hardware catalyst moment for virtual fashion to take the stage. Um, I didn't know if you had a take. What were your perspectives on virtual fashion and its role for brands? Yeah, I think a lot of it is dependent on the hardware and that being right. And the, the problem you have with virtual fashion today is that it's very fragmented. There's no single platform that we all agree on that we all use that really would lead to any kind of meaningful marketplace or ecosystem for brands to, to put out virtual fashion. Um, I think it's it's a concept that people are going to have to get used to. I think if you think about like, it's one of those concepts that for people, you know, who, who are slightly less native to new technology, maybe they grew up in a different generation, thought of this just doesn't make sense. There you are, they assessed. <laughs> It's a kind way of saying uh, boomers. Um, no, but but you know me, you know me included. I think like we we really adopted technology, you know, later into our our teenagers, our teenage years, even our early twenties, and um, we're not necessarily as comfortable, familiar with building these you know virtual identities, digital identities. But m many young people today, their their first experiences of technology involved virtual worlds, um, mm -hmm. and creating avatars in these virtual worlds. And they have already been primed with the idea of, um, you know, whether it's video game skins, whether it's even the Sims, they've already been primed with this idea of um, expressing themselves virtually and having these kind of digital extensions of their personalities and exploring that through fashion. It's only therefore um, a natural progression that, that will start to translate to how do I put virtual fashion on myself? Um, mm -hmm. and the, the, again, that the slight kind of mind shift there is that we now, you know, we live so much of our lives through the lens of a camera and we, you could argue that a, a lot of the time, the picture of the outfit or the picture of the piece of clothing that that person purchases is just as important to them as mm -hmm. them wearing it in real life. I think a good example is the, the screenshot that people take when they get the Nike you know, trainers from those drops that are super hard to get, that kind of like gotten, uh, got them screen, that gets shared more than the the picture of the, the shoe on their feet. And so when you kind of extrapolate that further, um, absolutely in the future, I think people will start to, well, you know, what's the difference between me putting this virtual piece of clothing on a picture of me or on some augmented reality version of me? Um, the difficult part is how exactly this plays out because there are so yeah, many platforms and there's so many different pieces of hardware being built right now. Very difficult to imagine which is the one we'll all be wearing. And maybe it's not. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Yeah. The way you described that wasn't too dissimilar to the debate. So I think first and foremost, when we use these catch-all terms, um, it's sometimes unhelpful because we have our own bias or perspective of what virtual fashion means. What I found enlightening was the clear definition of virtual fashion as a spectrum. You have truly virtual, mm -hmm. so fashion that is created to live in digital worlds. You have augmented fashion, which I think you were loosely alluding to there, this idea that you will augment styles and looks around you. And I think for a internet social first generation, that disconnect, and now we're seeing more generative art and we're seeing more brands play with real and um, CGI, you can start to see a world where actual augmented fashion maybe plays a role, particularly if we're all going to be wearing headsets in the not too distant future. And then finally, there's this category that probably has more a immediate application it's fashion for your avatars, meaning the digital version of you in any given world, metaverse, game, and beyond. Um, and each of those categories probably needs its own marketplace. And then you're going to have brands. And I think the way I've noticed, particularly luxury fashion, which are, are a sector that have the luxury and permission to play in these spaces more than most... Um, you tend to find they're just looking for kind of 
novel experiences to identify their most passionate, affluent young customer, right? That's kind of the space that they're looking for, those big commercial unlocks. Um, But overall, I found it very enlightening to have that three-way framing of fashion being virtual, augmented, and then fashion specifically for your avatars. Um, It leads me to a broader point, though, and it's a conversation we had a long time ago. And I remember saying to you, Kai, five, six years ago, I don't get virtual influencers. What's the point? And most people I asked that question to would give me a response. And I was like, nonsense. Still don't see a point in them. And your response was, they are not bound by human limitations. They are not bound by the things that me and you can do in front of a camera. They can do so much more. And suddenly when you remove those limitations, you go, okay, I have a renewed pursuit and fund or a new passion for its role in society. And when I think about fashion, fashion is simply expression. So I do think it's almost a foregone conclusion that we are going to have a digital fashion ecosystem. But I'm with you in the sense that I have no clue what comes first. And it's probably some kind of hardware catalyst that is going to have to lay the foundation for it to be, I suppose, material to the majority and not just, you know, niche communities. Absolutely. And and it has to make business sense for the brand. They have to have a, a way of generating revenue. And, you know, there are the brands, the, the best place to look for how brands are really experimenting commercially with virtual fashion is to, to Web3 NFTs. You see the way Nike, Nike are generating millions of dollars through, through selling virtual you know, sneakers. And that again is, it, it's a great kind of signal that, that, the directionally these brands think this is going to going to come but we're very much in the experimental phase right now where um yeah nobody knows exactly where it's going to live but they they're going to bet on it yeah i i don't see a world in the distant future where you know you buy an exclusive version of your football boots and you know, you get the same version that ends up in FIFA, you know, or, yep. or things of that nature. Mm-hmm. And that, that for me feels the more obvious place where either brands or companies will play. They're going to probably tap into the gaming community and these places first until, you know, some more significant shift in our behaviors, for example. Um, dude. I read an article, I know you're a big Twitter slash X fan. I read an article and I'm going to read it to you now. <clears throat> and I want to get your first reaction. And please do not swear. I won't describe the publication that said this, but it said, Musk destroyed all that. Twitter's business is flailing after a year of Elon. Advertisers spending less. Regulators are circling. Staff at less than 50%. And user numbers are down. It's a pretty damning headline. What do you think of Elon's first year at the helm of Now X? Yeah, I think it's probably quite a selective headline. It's very easy to pick out a, a handful of random stats without zooming out and really looking at the context. You know, are the user numbers? Anyone who's who looks at these social platforms or um you know, looks at usage of any big network, it's not all just up and to the right. It's It fluctuates, it goes up, it goes down. And I think there's probably different times during Elon's first year where they have been in, going in the right direction and times where they haven't. So I wouldn't look too much in, into that and I think it's, it's easy to sensationalize. Um, actually, most of those things aren't really important to what Elon's trying to do. I think Elon is, he recognized that Twitter needs com- a complete overhaul, right? It needs a complete restructuring and it needs to, he believes, he believes that in order for it to capture the value that he thinks it has, it needs to look fundamentally different to what it does, you know, what, what it did when he took it over. And that means trying a lot of things, launching a lot of experiments, breaking a lot of things. I think right now it's in a very weird transitional phase. I would argue that the, the Twitter experience is worse now than what it was when he took it over. Like anecdotally, just from my experience, it's a bit of a mess. The algorithm serves weird content. It's not mm-hmm. easy to keep up with the news. I used to be it used to be the number one place I would when I was like a, 
a soccer match on or a football game on, that's where I'd go to keep up with the game. I can't do it anymore. The, the, the platform is just not built for real time um, events like it used to be. Um, and so it's probably taking a lot less of my time and it's fundamentally a worse experience for me. But I think that's part of the process. I think he's, he's trying to build a completely different app and he has done some positive things in other, in other places. The monetization <laughs> and revenue sharing with users, I think was pretty transformational and one of those changes that sparked other networks in the industry to try and do the really? same thing. Um, and video, you've seen him experiment with long form video mm -hmm. on the platform and, and that's been hugely successful and something as a marketer I've jumped on, we, we've experimented with longer form video and um, it made me realize that these kind of restrictions that you sometimes see on these social platforms are usually arbitrary and actually people will just want to go wherever um, is, is most convenient for them to consume content. Mm -hmm. Same with long form content. I remember when he released the fact that, you know, there was no character limit anymore. I kind of thought that was a ridiculous move, but actually people don't want to leave the network. They want to stay on and consume the content they're used to consuming in the places that they're familiar with. And so I actually think that was net positive for content creators and a lot of the other changes has been, but um, overall, I don't think it's fair to, to zoom in on year one now and, and really make a call because this is, he's going for a big swing. He's not trying to make a few small changes here and there. He's trying to turn this into a, you know, 500 billion, 1 trillion plus dollar company. And that's going to take completely throwing a few things out and um, changing the experience in the short term. You know what that's going to take? Hands on keyboard. Exactly. Which... And look, that's, you know, Twitter's, you know, you say Twitter's staff are down 50%, but I think that's, that's probably a, uh, uh, a result of them not being in agreement with the hands-on keyboard strategy that Elon is, uh, Elon is proposing. It's very possible. It's very possible. Um, I tend to agree with your observations. I think they're fair. You're fundamentally right in the sense that Elon only plays radical games. He's playing to win. My my concern, I, I admire a lot of the changes. I I tend to believe the problem for Twitter to truly succeed. Um, I think they're going to do so many interesting product developments. I think they're going to turn the levers that are required to cause social media to change in a meaningful way, positive and negative. I think Twitter is going to play a very influential role across the social media spectrum. However, I tend to believe that they will fall into the trap that Snap did in the sense that Snap were always the most innovative platform. They were playing around with augmentation and filters and did like D to C direct communication and, you know, every ephemeral, every, almost every sort of major trend with the exclusion. And even then they were pretty early in the short form video in discover feed type formula so snap's always been one of those platforms where they've really from a product standpoint um innovated and led the <clears throat> way but then meta just pulled the features that work that they can commercialize and just integrate them better into the experience yeah. and I, I tend to believe that's maybe what's going to happen with that we're going to see um, radical, experimental, some wonderful updates, and they're just going to get replicated and done better elsewhere. Um, so my Threads. overall thing is net positive. Threads, I'll be honest, I have not looked at Threads since my first <laughs> week of enthusiasm. Um, <laughs> I, you know what? But Instagram have tried very hard to put features and I, I my stance was always when meta get behind a product or launch something new you should pay attention doesn't mean yep. they will succeed but you should 100 percent pay attention and there is a universal truth that there are outlier advantages to being first and early so if you are a brand it is a good habit 
to test, learn, and play in new spaces. And that's what Threads was. What didn't happen maybe fast enough is it didn't find its identity. So what, if I go into Threads now, I will get a few, let's say, vacuous opinions from people on Instagram that I may have followed a long time ago. And I now get occasional updates because they haven't been able to capture creator attention. There was a big opportunity for Threads and I think they had to go more aggressive into trying to offer exclusive content or paying creators. If they'd have gone from the jump and went, we're really going to invest in this platform and we're going to put a creator fund that is meaningful and significant. If you incentivize thought leaders, they would have gone in their droves. And I think that mm -hmm. might have been enough of a catalyst to sustain users and keep people active. Do I think people will return to threads? I don't know. I'm, I'm less bullish now, but it's always a time will tell thing. Yeah, and I remember, what, I think when we had this conversation when when around when threads launched, um, I think my, my take was that like this, this, this launch strategy of just, you know, throwing, you know, having, going from zero to 100 million users in day one actually just doesn't work for most social networks. And uh -huh. the beauty of Twitter in the early days was this kind of slow, steady curation, which meant that the early experience was incredibly high quality, incredibly high signal. Um, I've been using a, a new social network more and more uh, called Farcaster, which is a, um, a kind of decentralized social network, which is the same as Threads. So Threads is also a decentralized social network, but Farcaster is um, like built on, on blockchain. And mm -hmm. it basically means that when you build your audience on Farcaster, uh, you can carry that audience around with you to other social networks built on the same protocol. And so if I get 10,000 followers on Farcaster, I owe those followers. They, they, the, the, the network can't take them away from me. They can't, um, they can't deplatform me. They can't reduce my reach. Um, and so it's become a, a kind of alternative Twitter that more and more people are using. And it's had this incredibly steady flow, but, um, uh, but they have really good momentum. And so they just hit their kind of like hit their record all time highs. I think they only have like, 3,000 people using them every day. But the quality of people on there is just so, so high. So it's all the biggest kind of crypto founders. These are people that I could never reach on Twitter. You know, I, I, I was a million steps away from. But you're now able to converse with and connect with very high signal, very high quality people. And the content on there is just, you know, it's 100% quality. There is no, um, you know, low quality videos, no engagement farming it's like you know when you see these social networks in these early stages when and that's when they're at their most magic and then as time goes on they tend to become kind of diluted and a bit messy and i'm convinced that you know i'm watching a future significant social network grow in real time because this is where the traction comes from it comes from people like me going onto these platforms and my my experience being 10 times better than twitter because the curated individuals on there are only high signal as opposed to threads. It was like the biggest shit show of memes <laughs> and brands and just every, everything I don't want in the social network. And so we'll see, like Farcaster may or may not get, get meaningful adoption, but it's, I'm convinced it feels like the early days of Twitter. And there's a lot of people that agree with me. So we'll see. So are we going to call this segment Catty Predicts? Yeah. And Jay, can you make sure that Catty wears some kind of like mystic hat? So yeah. he looks, put a crystal ball like in him. front of him. A crystal ball here, yeah. Got it. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. Farcaster, the next big thing you've never heard of. You know what? Um, I am always skeptical of new social media apps. We see a lot of investments pass through our doors. And when anyone tells me they're going to build a new social media app, they may as well tell me they bought a lottery ticket. Like, that's how I typically view you're going to build a product. I'm going to build because there are so many conflating factors. It's the chicken and egg. It's the, you yeah. know, cost to keep people's attention. It's the struggle of retention. There's so many things that work against you. And you have to land these exceptional network effects. Um, and there is a bit of a playbook. 
but fundamentally it's a very, very thankless, hard task with incredibly great rewards. The way you were describing, I hadn't heard of Farcaster. However, the way you described it, I go, I see a world where that means a lot to a creator. I'm thinking in the, the yeah. social media space, one of the bigger challenges creators have is not owning their audience. The yep. consistent reduction of their reach, that they have invested time. People always argue, you get free reach. So, you know, you shouldn't be frustrated when the algorithm kills your reach. I kind of go yes and no, because I understand that perspective that you are not owed anything. But people invest so much time. And if time is our most valuable commodity, people will hold that in high regard. So when you describe to me an ability to create something that is interoperable, that I can take to other areas, the chances are that a future social network will be built on the blockchain are probably very high. And this will probably be a cornerstone feature or value proposition that will lead to their success. So uh, whether or not this application or social network works, who knows, but um, I think it's an interesting space. And I am about to go download this app after this podcast and have a play around and be yep. a catty-like early adopter. Because I do remember when you told me to buy a monkey JPEG all those <laughs> years ago and you were paying a couple of thousand dollars and I was like, Catman, you're going crazy. New York's just turned you crazy. <laughs> and it turned out you were very right, an incredibly good move. So now, Katy yeah. Predicts is my favorite segment. So I'm going to lean into that. I, I, and just on, just on, just quickly on decentralized social networks, it's it's funny because it's such an old concept that um, for some reason we moved away from. So like, email is this exact idea that when I build an audience. Doesn't matter where I build it, what platform I use, I should be able to explore and keep that audience. Then, yeah. and um, you know, email is as a result one of the most powerful audiences you can build because really? there is no middleman, there is no there is no social media giant who can take it away from you. And we seem to kind of start with that concept, which in Web One it was a email was a decentralized protocol that nobody owns, but we could all build on top of. We then move into Web Two, where the social networks kind of took back control. And so now I'm having to relearn this new concept. Is it? And uh, Meta, Instagram, they built threads on a decentralized protocol for this exact reason. They see that this is the way this is going. Now their protocol isn't built on blockchain, but it's it's still the same concept. Is it? And so um, directionally, that is where I think you know the the builders will understand that is where creators are going to want to build their audiences because it's too much of a risk when your whole livelihood is built on uh, borrowed land, essentially. Mm -hmm. Most movements and revolutions are formed on an ideology. They're rooted mm -hmm. to an idea. And the internet movement was about creating fairer systems that democratize power back to the individual. We then, to your point, the internet evolved and the world we ended up with wasn't that. And it's funny now how we come full circle to that same ideology. And I always used to find the debates that went off between the Web3 maximalists and everybody else, where people that believed in crypto and the blockchain, they would be kind of anti everything that came before them. Mm -hmm. um, and I always thought, you know, history is very telling. And generally speaking, most people didn't connect the dots between the enthusiasm and the mentality and the ideology that was driving the Web3 movement was the exact same as the internet. There is no yep. difference whatsoever. Yep. Just capitalism and agenda got in the middle of it, right? But it's the same yep. ideology. Exactly. And it's, that's always going to happen when there is such a huge amount of money circulating and so many people who are there purely to... Um, take a cut of that money. It's 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 unavoidable, unfortunately. Dude, what do you think of creator-led brands? I'm speaking more and more to companies that are wanting to partner with creators to produce product lines, and creators now are recognizing their value and worth. And in many cases, the elite creators know for them to maximize their value, they need equity. If they are going to promote something, 
They want to have skin in the game. So we're seeing more and more people launch brands and everybody points to the outlier successes. We'll say Mr. Beast does amazing selling chocolate. The guy could probably sell anything with the biggest audience in the world, right? Um, Prime, you take the UK's biggest YouTuber, one of America's biggest YouTubers, certainly one of the most popular, combine them in an unlikely partnership and relentlessly plug a drink largely to children. Um, and obviously, they have this meteoric success. However, I tend to see so many creator brands launch and fail. What do you think of this movement? And is it really a tale of two halves, the haves and have nots? Is it more like just brands in general? No, I, th I think the hardest thing about launching any brand is distribution and marketing if you're starting from zero. And so working with a creator or being a creator just solves that problem from day one. And so it just makes so much sense. And for a creator, like we've been talking about, it's very difficult to monetize your audience sustainably for a long period of time, obviously, unless you're the 0.1%. Yeah. And so being able to funnel your audience and your engagement into a tangible asset is really, really attractive. I think what it doesn't guarantee, though, is that the product you launch is going to be successful. You know, you mentioned mm -hmm. Mr. Beast. He, he's actually had a couple of failures in, you know, Mr. Beast Burger, the which burger. ultimately didn't didn't work out in the end. And so the, the product fundamentals still have to be correct. Um, I think it's the difference between the creators who are also incredible entrepreneurs. Because, you know, just because you are a creator isn't going to suddenly solve supply chain issues, building up a, a team, operations, finances. There's still 10, 20 other things that you need to get right. What you have done is you made life a lot easier for yourself when it comes to distribution and when it comes to marketing. And honestly, like being able to launch a product from zero to 100 like that is the biggest head start anybody could ask for. But I think it doesn't guarantee success beyond that. And so I think it's just a, it's like, we're going to see a lot of failures and a lot of successes, but if you're a creator and you want to build long-term sustained value, yeah. I think it is the absolute best model that people are, are now figuring out. This is the way creators should go. Um, and yeah, I think like you mentioned a few examples, I think even Kim Kardashian skins is, is, is one that, that, that sits under this, but that's obviously, you know, almost 30 years of being one of the most famous women in the planet now coming into to you know one kind of product machine i want to go into the skims point but let me let me agree and disagree with you in to your yeah. point i think your characterization is spot on um one of the harder things for any organization any brand or product is to garner attention in the attention economy and having that edge Super advantageous. So I, I think you're right in saying it is a huge enabler for a company. Where I probably disagree is that, and, and it's we're probably going to, we're, we're speaking the same language, but I'm coming at it from a slightly different angle. I yeah. would say the majority of creators and influencers do not have any influence. They are void of influence. They have a social following but they don't have influence. If you are a creator with actual authority and influence and trust over an audience, I think you have endless and countless ways to monetize that and create things of value um, as long as you don't erode your authority, your authenticity, your trust. So I think... Yes, I agree that the enabler of having a large audience is really helpful. I think every business is not just one thing, it's many. So I think the key with these creator brands and probably why Prime was such a success is they partnered with a company that did this time and time again. They playbooked it. They probably made all the mistakes. They got so many things wrong. And by the time they showed up with Logan Paul and KSI, they really knew what they were doing and had that then ability to scale at the pace they have. So I think generally speaking, I agree with the observation, but I think way too many brands and companies will be eager or they will at the very least overestimate a creator's value and influence in the world. And dude, you spoke about Kim Kardashian 
Um, I think first and foremost, I, w I was when you you said her name, I was thinking there is probably not a single figure on the planet that has that more physical influence on the world, meaning how many people are inspired and now look or take the Kim Kardashian look, the contouring and. You know, I, I can't think of a person that's maybe had as much physical influence over how people look um, in society. Maybe David Beckham when we were growing up and we all had the hair, haircuts and we would like have the mohawk for a week and then shave the hair. Maybe, but um, I can't think of anyone else that's had that same sort of influence on physical appearance. Exactly. And, and now she's cashing in. She understands that. And it's, you know, how do I actually... Uh, retain some of the value that I'm giving to the world here and I think yeah, Skims is like the culmination of that yeah Skims is really interesting of late um, I think there's a broader point to take so two things I noted and I may get one of them may have been a joke and I missed the like reveal so I, I'll caveat that that I don't know with certainty but a maybe a month ago Skims launched a uh, a mail line and I thought oh that's interesting Makes sense, it's broader. And I think brands that are very attached to a gender in all they do, it's kind of hard for them to have authority in a in a different arena. So what did they do? They went all in with three very notable global athletes. And I saw people herald in their marketing strategy as genius. And I was like, okay, well, paying very big celebrities and sports stars to front your brand. I don't know if that's genius, but it's effective. We know that to be true. It certainly can be effective. And then more recently, maybe about a week ago, I saw a piece of content where Kim Kardashian was promoting a new classic line, but I'm trying to say this tactfully, but basically it had a nipple in the garment. So it was kind of a play on being like too hot and cold in the content. It was quite satirical. The ad was kind of good. And and the reason I say, I don't know whether that's a real product or not, but my broader point is if that was a product and they've just launched the mail line, they're now launching this product where it deliberately shows a nipple and puts a fake nipple in the garment. I don't know why you do that, but let's say that is a real thing. Um, is there a danger with brands and what signal what is signaled to the world when brands start acting really irreverent and doing lots of things and like almost feel desperate for attention? Is that a red flag or do you applaud the kind of bravery that's involved with like doing new things? I think we're probably going to see a lot more of this. I think almost parody product as a marketing strategy is, is actually really powerful. Um, you know, you look at mischief, the kind of product studio um, who they released the the uh, the big red boot this year, um, probably the most viral product launch of the year. And so this is a you know mischief. You don't know what it is. It's a product studio that basically just launch kind of viral products. And um, in the you know they've done, they've done it across every industry, but they they have skewed towards kind of fashion streetwear, and they've done collaborations with Crocs, um, with Nike as well, or rather some unofficial collaborations. <laughs> and I think they've taught the world that, um, you know, when you have the cultural significance of a big brand, um, you have immense power to engineer virality if you come up with a product which is built for virality. And the Big Red Boot was genius because it was um, so recognizable and, you know, was the the best product for passing the the mobile phone screen test, which is, you know, how can you easily recognize a product if you held your phone far away from your screen and this was the most impossible to miss product of all time? And so these are just a, you know, a product studio that really understand engineering virality. And I think this Kim Kardashian launch is a, 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 a um, at least from that playbook. I think, it's, mm -hmm. I think it's understanding this isn't a product they're looking to make money on, but this is an ad that they know is going to be shared and a product people will buy for the kind of viral Instagram picture, um, sheer humor of it. And as a mm -hmm. result, they're going to get a huge amount of reach from it. As long as the product doesn't detach from their mm -hmm. kind of core brand principles, I think it's a smart move. 
and um, something we'll probably see more of. I love that. And Mischief, I'm right in saying they started as an advertising agency in Brooklyn and they yep. were known for doing these very irreverent, innovative, cool activations. And off the back of that, they just started spinning products. And the one that probably came to mind for, me, for mine is like no new, um, like no stories are bad stories was when they got sued by, I think it was the little Nas X collection. And they yeah, sat the, them and they got sued by Nike, yeah. right? Yeah, they put blood uh, in a Nike Air Max. Um, was it blood? Yeah, it was blood for, for the kind of you know Satan collection. Um, yeah. And had huge backlash from Nike. Obviously, no permission whatsoever. They, they, they'd already released. <laughs> um, their first ever drop was the, they put holy water in the, um, in the Nike Air Max. So it was kind of like the, the heaven and hell collection. And, um, yeah, I think they're the epitome of asking for forgiveness rather than permission. Um, I respect and, it. I... Yeah, like you said, they started as an agency. They were clearly an ideas factory and have realized that rather than, um, you know, relying on client retainers to generate revenue, we're going to release our own products and are significantly by multitudes more successful than they were as an agency. So probably one of the most interesting pivots we've seen. Yeah, they, they took their value proposition, which is, to your point, then ideas machines. And they went, yep. let's let's do it for ourselves and attach themselves and almost built this kind of robust cult following. And yep. every now and again, kind of cut through. I, I, I do want to mention something you just said there, because I hadn't heard the phrase before, and I love this. The, the mobile phone test. I think if you're launching a product today, I, it's one of the reasons why Prime works so well. You know, mm -hmm. Prime, yep. I see them as the sponsor of the Wayans at UFC. They're sponsoring um, many kind of combat events, sporting events, I think by Munich. And when you see the bottle and the vibrancy and the, just the, the um, I suppose, bold, avert font, all of that combined basically is doing exactly what you just described. The phone test. Does your product yep. stand out from five meters away from a mobile phone? If the answer is to that, yes, you'll probably or stand more chance of doing well on social media. I love that. Yep. And they've even got a name, you know, a name of the product which shares one of the biggest, you know, Amazon Prime, one of the biggest other products in the world. But it doesn't matter yeah. because when you're so when you're that recognizable, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, they, they, they managed to kind of break all the rules there. It's interesting. A lot of people get caught up on names. And, yeah. you know, one of the biggest advantages you can have as a new brand, you create a company's familiarity. You hijack and steal and the, um, the neurological pathways that we create through marketing and products and our interactions with big brands. So, you know, when you have a company and your name is like, love something. You already yeah. have that attention. Um, yeah. What's your disadvantage is hard to own. It becomes harder in the kind of digital ecosystem to own. Very yeah. common phrases in the vernacular. But I'm a big believer in if you break through as an organization and you steal a verb, like you win. I love those. Yeah. Um, I love, like you say, Prime. It's already kind of stands for something. Um, dude, just last thing before we go into our debate of the week, I want to ask you about product marketing because you've been heavily active. I keep seeing launches week after week with you guys. Um, what has your latest set of product launches taught you? And I suppose, are there any valuable lessons that you've garnered in the last few months? Yeah, we, we've had, we've had like a kind of crazy busy few months of, of shipping product and, uh, most recently just like an interesting kind of experience launching uh, one of our kind of flagship products for the year. Um, and usually with our product launches, you know, we'll center it around like one big piece of content that will kind of contain all the context you need. We'll do like a flashy video. Um, with this recent one, we did, we did our, our usual product launch, did a great video around it, you know, got some initial traction. We noticed that a lot of the people, a lot of the positive reaction around the launch was actually around one single feature in the, the product launch. And it was a little bit kind of obscured and, and buried under all of the other features that we talked about. And so, um, 
as a follow-up, we produced just a, a whole host of, of, of kind of follow-up content, which really drove home that one single feature that we saw people um, really pick up on. And as a result, that follow-up content we produced it was picked up by kind of influencers in the space. It was reshared everywhere. It got us 10 times the reach that we ever would have got from our original uh, launch activation. And it kind of reminded me of a really powerful lesson that, you know, with product marketing, the, the launch is only really the start of your work. It should never be really? seen as like the end. You should never launch and then kind of sit back and, and wait for things to happen. Um, and I think what the great thing about social media is that, it, it, is that you have all the data to tell you exactly where people are, are getting positive reactions from and where the um the interest in your actual product is and so um yeah we then produced a, a bunch of follow-up content which has really kind of solidified the launch beyond what we could have done and so just always something to remember when it comes to you know doing these kind of things that um often people like the you know you see they'll they'll, they'll launch the thing they'll really? sit back and then they'll probably wonder you know why aren't people reacting to this but Actually, you had no idea how the launch was going to go. You had no data. You had no information from your audience. Now you have that data. It's now a better time to kind of go again. And um, you know, at, at times, relaunch if you have to. It's the cardinal sin I see across every industry. Everybody overestimates the value of a moment. And I get it. As a company, as an organization, you're often consumed by whatever it is you're doing. And you often, as a result of that, assume the world cares. They don't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, amount of times we're asked, you know, what should our campaign moment and people will disproportionately allocate resources and budget towards these big moments. And I always consider yeah. them really high risk strategies. I think in today's age, we don't need to have as much guesswork in marketing. Mm -hmm. Famously, Ogilvy said a long time ago, um, 50% of marketing works, 50% doesn't. I just don't know which half uh, yeah. is working, right? Famous quote. I had to think in, there's some truth in that, but the reality is today with our ability in post-production, with our ability to quickly adjust, with our ability to target new audiences off the bat, with our ability to get real-time feedback, there is no excuse to not you know, evolve and shift a campaign. I actually think campaigns of today that are highly effective need layers. I would always start with your theory that's backed by insight and data and your experience and all the things you know. That's how you start your campaign. I would yep. make sure that you always have a soft launch period where either you have feedback coming from an exclusive group of customers or users, power users, people that can, you know, help you shape the things that you may have overlooked um, or just launch it and then reiterate from there. In this case, I don't think there's yep. one right solution, but I do think there's a methodology to firstly, not overestimating your campaign moments, making sure you're using feedback to work your way towards the right answers and certainly do that before you deploy significant media budgets, um, especially digitally where planning cycles can be much shorter. I think that's a much more effective way to run a marketing function today. Agreed. Cool. My man, debate of the week. We're going to close out and we're going onto a big topic here. Chat GPT, the product of the year, the product of the last two years, I'm going to say. How long mm -hmm. have we been out? Eight main months, whatever. Chat GPT. Now you could argue the hype has died down a little. The question I want to ask you is Chat GPT going to change the world? I don't know if it's going to change the world, does it? That's a, a loaded question. I think yes. I think chat, I think AI will Get change the, the world. Get off the fence. Get off that fence that you're perched on. <laughs> I think yes, but we just don't know how yet. Um, I think it's it's added values to my life that I never really could have predicted uh, or or I could really contextualize against another product. 
like you know there's some there's some there's some things that it's doing for me now which I don't know how any other product could do in the future so for example like I'm dealing with very complicated tax issues in the US and I'm dealing with contracts and things that you know uh chap GPT doesn't replace an accountant or replace a lawyer but it gives me yet. an understanding yet but it gives me an understanding of my situations that uh, actually lawyers and accountants aren't very good at doing um, because they're very, very technical in the way they speak and they use language, which is often very confusing and um, obscure and, you know, designed to complicate a lot of the times. ChatGPT has it's kind of been like my, you know, personal you know, assistant when it comes to dealing with very complex and stressful personal issues, which has made it a lot easier and a lot a lot more understandable. And I think, wow, like that that's value that I, I you can't really put a yeah. figure on. Um and we're only really scratching the surface and starting to understand the ways that this becomes really valuable. Um so I think yes. I just don't know how. Okay, I was hoping you were gonna say no, because I had a follow up question for you. Because the the reality is I was I I would give people the comparison of going did Google change the world? I think absolutely. Creating order and being creating order on the internet and being the best search engine that achieved complete dominance in the world. I think Google has aided my life for the last 15 years or whatever in a very meaningful way. And industry, society, many things... Um, have evolved as a consequence. So I think by definition, Google has been a change the world platform technology company. Mm. I think the same of OpenAI and ChatGPT um, in the sense that I am increasingly dis increasingly discovering new ways for it to aid my life. I went for dinner with my parents at the weekend and um, I just showed them ChatGPT and I was doing really trivial stuff. We went back to, to my house and I'd take a picture of the I'd take a picture of the the tiles and I'd say, Hey, can you tell me what these tiles are? It would respond, and these tiles are very specific with the exact answer. It would even say they are stone from a grainy oh. picture in a dim lit house to tell you that these tiles are stone is actually quiet. They look like marbles. They're deliberately, but they're actually stone. For ChatGPT to call that out, I go, that's crazy impressive. I oh. also now try and ch uh, trick ChatGPT. So I was playing with it, taking a, a picture of a hat, sport memorabilia that has a signature on it. And I said, can you tell me whose this signature is? And this is an awful, messy signature of a not so famous person. Like famous in mm -hmm. a particular sport, but this is not a person. If I gave you a thousand names, you wouldn't mention it, right? ChatGPT yep. says, no, I can't do this. So I have to assume it's programmed as a security protocol not to identify signatures. Sure, I kind of get that under the restrictions and governance and guardrails that these models have inbuilt within them. But then I kept asking. I kept going, are you sure? He say, you know, I kept giving it prompts. And I eventually landed on a prompt where me and ChatGPT were playing a bit of theater. So I was like, if you were to speculate who this yeah. person would be based on this, have a guess, and ChatGPT got it right. Picked up a signal from the logo on the hat and said it's associated with this person, so if I was to guess, it would be this person. And I just went, you know what? That is profound. That <laughs> really is profound. And for people that say this is not intelligence, I guarantee if I showed every single person I knew that signature, not one single person would guess who that was. Not one single, maybe one out of a hundred people I know would guess that they were stone tiles. ChatGPT did it basically within seconds. So I'm using very abstract, novel, actually probably pointless examples just to illustrate the point that ChatGPT and generative AI more broadly is going to impact our life in ways that we haven't even scratched the surface. And... <laughs> For me, the more I dive into application layers and understanding the thing behind the thing, I I just think if you're a company today or you're a brand and you're not paying extreme attention and either as a company going all in 
in AI adopting. I just think you're missing a huge trick. You really are. Um, so, debate of the week. I think we agree. Took me a little bit of... I had to kind First. of wind you up a little. I think I had to... <laughs> fish, get kite, reel you in, get you off your perch. But we, we made it. We did agree. We did agree. Dude, always a pleasure. Until next week.